So I'm so excited tonight to introduce to you Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who is the founder and CEO of the Center for Youth Wellness. She has earned international attention for her innovative approach to addressing adverse childhood experiences as a risk factor for adult disease such as heart disease and cancer. Her work has demonstrated that it's time to reassess the relationship between poverty, child development, and health, and how the practical applications of the Adverse Childhood Experiences study can improve health outcomes. Dr. Burke Harris currently serves as an expert advisor on the Too Small to Fail initiative championed by Hillary Clinton and the Clinton Foundation in association with the next generation. The goal of the Center for Youth Wellness is ambitious to create a clinical model that recognizes and effectively treats toxic stress in children and to change the standard of pediatric practice in our nation. I had the privilege of hearing Dr. Burke Harris a month or so ago address a large group of people and I will tell you, if anybody can convince you, it is Dr. Burke Harris. She is an incredible speaker. Her passion comes through like nobody's business. With that, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. Before she comes up, I'm going to remind you of one thing. There are cards on your table for questions. Yes, Kim? Yes. There are cards on the table for questions. As Professor Heckman comes up, if you have them, please work, jot them down and staff will come by and pick them up uh, as we continue. Sorry about that. But Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Camille, and thank you to the Advancement Project and the Department of Education. This is really um, kind of a career pinnacle moment for me <laughs> um, to be able to introduce uh, tonight's keynote speaker, Professor James Heckman. I uh, first really was introduced to Professor Heckman um, by Paul Tuff, who is a writer uh, who wrote an article that was in the New Yorker magazine and ultimately wrote a book called How Children Succeed. And um, he, he featured both of our, our work in this book, my work as a pediatrician working with uh, low-income communities in the Bayview-Hunters Point neighborhood in San Francisco and trying to understand uh, what I was seeing in the patients that I was caring for and how I not only as a pediatrician working in this community, but how I could use my voice to elevate the status of my patients so that we could develop systems that are responsive to the impacts of early adversity on our children and how they affect health and development over the life course. And so we created the Center for Youth Wellness specifically to prevent, screen, and heal the impacts of early adversity um, and uh, toxic stress. And in the course of this work, getting to know the work of Dr. Heckman, who has been, an, a, for me, a personal hero, and who has brought powerful evidence on the importance of investing in early childhood development. Dr. Heckman is the Henry Schultz Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago, a Nobel Prize winning uh, winner in economics, and an expert on the economics of human development. Through the university's Center for Economics of Human, human Development, he has conducting, conducted groundbreaking work with a consortium of economists, developmental psychologists, sociologists, statisticians, and neuroscientists, showing that the quality of early childhood development heavily influences health, economic, and social outcomes for individuals and for society at large. 
Dr. Heckman has shown that there are great economic gains to be had by investing in early childhood development. His recent research focuses on human development and life cycle skill formation with a special emphasis on the economics of early childhood development. His research gives policymakers important new insights into such areas as education, job training programs, minimum wage legislation, anti-discrimination law, social supports, and civil rights. He is also a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the Econo Econometric Society, the Society of Labor Economics, and the American Statistical Association, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Please, well, please join me in welcoming Professor James Heckman. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Nadine. I appreciate it. Uh, and I, I really do uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak before you. It's an honor to address this group. It's uh, celebrated. I guess it's somewhat unusual for me to be standing in front of you because I'm not a pediatrician. I'm not a developmental psychologist. I, I'm not a neuroscientist. And yet I'm talking about all of these issues. And, uh, what I am is an economist, and uh, you've seen plenty of ads uh, suggesting how, oh, yes, thank you, I forgot, I'm gonna need that, about how uh, economists are pretty dull people, and they are as a group. And there's also a notion that economists are sometimes known for explaining things in great complexity. And there is complexity here, and that's what partly makes this, this whole process of how people become human beings, how they develop, and what, good profiles for the development uh, are, what, how, how we might actually create successful lives, the opportunity, it's a huge and fascinating question. And it's one that draws me to this area. But I want to actually talk about some simple lessons today and also to draw on my comparative advantage, and that is as an economist. And I want to present some simple lessons, maybe uh, overly simple lessons, but I want to try to review the argument because what led me into early childhood and the whole work on early childhood is that I've done a great deal of work on skill formation across the whole life cycle. In fact, starting with work uh, some years ago when I was evaluating remediation programs for adolescents and young adults and finding that many of the job training programs and many of the interventions that were being tried in that time period, say 20, 25 years ago, were actually not all that successful. And so I was drawn to either two conclusions. One was conclusion that there wasn't anything you could do, and many people have made that argument, or maybe we should try something else. And as I researched the literature, and I'll summarize some of that, I found that there actually were some very promising interventions. And kind of like George was saying earlier today um, in, his, in some of his uh, remarks to a private, smaller group, that when you start looking at the high school dropout problem or why uh, some children are going to college and some are not. As we try to unravel what's going on, we're always led to go back earlier and earlier and earlier in the life. And this is actually more or less my trajectory as well. So I want to try to summarize what is relevant. But I also I want to point out that the argument I'm making really is an economic argument. And I think one of the things that I found very interesting was that in many areas of uh, public policy, there's a tremendous tension between what people want to do, what they feel is socially fair or just, based on an ethical criterion, and what's economically efficient. And that's the so-called equity efficiency trade-off. And what I find striking, and have found striking in my work, is that this so-called equity efficiency trade-off really doesn't exist, at least for early childhood. And that's why I want to say that uh, tonight, when we think about the problems of California and how we might approach them in the most fruitful way, that this is one of the policies where you can sort of have your cake and eat it too, in the sense that you can actually have genuine social compassion and then find that that's rooted in sound economics. And the sound economics in part consists of saying, suppose that we don't do it. What happens if we wait? What happens if we delay? And so I really want to consider those arguments today. 
So in 2015, California is going to spend about 61% of its annual budget on education, health, and welfare, a total of $121 billion, I estimate. And of course, like every other state, every other governmental agency, uh, there's real issue of how we can raise money and support this. And we know that social costs are going up every year. And uh, we know that, uh, uh, that, that, that the projected budget is, is larger uh, in this coming year. Now, many people doubt the value of such investments. And in fact, if you just talk about what you kind of like or what you kind of have a hunch about, uh, that's kind of difficult in a political context. I, I realize it can be successful, it can be very persuasive, but in the end, what's important in the long term, what lasts, is something that is a demonstrated, successful approach towards addressing a range of problems. So I want to talk about a strategy that would actually address all of these questions, education, health, and welfare, with a consolidated strategy of early childhood. And I want to suggest that what we really want to think about in terms of reducing costs and promoting benefits is not just cutting social spending, but considering what are the benefits in terms of crime, reduced crime, reduced special education, promoting better health, and promoting greater social opportunity. And I think what the evidence shows, and I'll try to summarize this evidence, is that making wise investments in early childhood development produces benefits that are far in excess of cost. And there's a body of evidence. It's not just one or two studies. Many people focus on this study or that study. I think what we need to do when we approach this in a very in a, in a, in an empirically fruitful way is we draw evidence from all sources, uh, studies that are experimental, studies that are non-experimental. I want to try to enunciate a vision that promotes economic growth and economic opportunity. So what are the challenges that face, let's see, is this, uh, yes, there it is. So what are the challenges that face American society? Not just California, but of course California is an important uh, component of, uh, of America, a big chunk of the population, and, uh, and, and creative ideas are really coming out of California. So what are the challenges? We know, and it's frequently discussed, the issues about economic inequality and divided society. We hear a lot of talk about the 99% versus the one, uh, we know that the economy is starting to improve. Job growth has increased. But right now, the discussion about social and economic inequality is still heavily ideological. It's really not rooted, I think, in a sound analysis of what the benefits and the costs are and what the benefits are compared to the costs of not making such investments. So I want to talk about a problem that I think is extremely important. So this, this is a graph I think you've all seen a version of. I don't know if you can really read it all that well, but it really is showing uh, the cumulative growth and after inflation adjusted after tax income by uh, uh, before tax income group. And what we can see is that over time, as we move from the uh, a few 20, 30 years ago to now, that the top 1% of the income distribution really has benefited. And we also know that, if you look at the middle class, that there has been relatively stagnant growth in wages for most workers, except the highly skilled. And so these are problems that are on the agenda today. They will certainly be on the agenda next year in the presidential campaigns. Both Republicans and Democrats are talking. All candidates, both Republicans and Democrats, actually, that I know, are now addressing these issues. So the question is, how can we try to reduce inequality, increase productivity, and lower deficits? And how can we do this in a way that is really not partisan? It's not a question of Republican or Democrat, one that really sinks at the question of what is economically sound and can be justified by the available evidence. And I want to just make a, what is really a truism. I mean, it's trite almost, but it's really important, and it gets neglected. And especially gets neglected when you go back to the graph about the 99 versus the 1. I think the way we can really reduce inequality for the large majority of individuals and promote social mobility is by solving America's skills problem. So if we look close and hard at the facts, rising inequality in skills is the major contributor to rising uh, 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 economic and social inequality. It's not just that some people are getting rich. I realize there's a whole rhetoric out there about uh, 
suggesting that we can tax the top 1% and redistribute. But what I want to talk about is not a notion of a zero-sum approach to public policy, but an investment approach where we actually use our funds wisely, we use policy wisely, and don't think that we can just redistribute from one to give to the other, but think of how we can invest in individuals to promote the futures and integrate people into a common American society. So skills are very, very important, and there's a lot of evidence on this. I'll just put up one example uh, of one of many examples when we look about where the, where the real problem is in inequality in American society. This is a graph that shows what the real weekly earnings are, this is 1963 dollars, of individuals who have a bachelor's degree, beyond a bachelor's degree, compared to those individuals who are high school dropouts. Those are the ones at the very bottom. And so what we've seen, and this is a manifestation of a worldwide trend really, is that the demand for skilled workers has accelerated. But at the same time that this demand has accelerated, we see that the US economy has actually been very sluggish in producing those skills. And this is not something that is just unique to one state or one area. If you go around the country, if you go to the Federal Reserves in Dallas or anywhere, actually, in the United States, in Minneapolis, for example, where I was recently, what you will see is that there is, generally speaking, among many entrepreneurs, many businessmen, now experiencing more demand for their products, there's a lack of skilled workers. Skilled workers, not just college graduates, but even high school graduates, people who can show up on time, people who would actually have the kind of skills that we know are the foundation for successful workplaces. And so what we see in this graph here is that over time, if we look at individuals born over different time periods, between, say, 1930 and 1975, there's been a slowdown in the rate of high school graduation. And it's particularly pronounced, of course, for males, uh, but it's also true for females. Now, there is a sense that the economy has responded in part. I'm an economist. So you say, OK, the wages went up for college graduates. The wages really went up for, college, for graduates above college and those who have uh, professional degrees. Why wasn't there a greater response? Well, there was a response. If you look, for example, at people who are getting some college or people with four-year degrees, you can see that at least for females and now even for men, you're seeing a growth, a response. So the price has gone up, the return to going to college has gone up, and more, are going, more people are going to college. But what we also see, and until very recently, we saw the high school dropout rate was actually increasing. Now it's stabilized, and there's some evidence that it's even declined, although there's controversy about that. And what's happening, and this is something that's often remarked, is that two Americas are emerging, and society is becoming polarized. So what we're seeing is the decline of the middle class, especially the blue collar working class. Income inequality and social class inequality have increased. And this has, I think, serious intergenerational consequences. And this has been written about extensively by many demographers. I've written on it. Charles Murray wrote a very interesting book called Coming Apart, The State of White America, 1960 to 2010. And there are other recent books on this. So there are many studies that, that, short, that show this. So what we're actually seeing then is that a certain valuable set of skills is not being produced, but some children are in fact gaining access. So there's an issue. Why are we seeing this phenomenon? Why is it that we're seeing what appears to be some polarization? Not just an income, but who goes to college and what the next generation may bring. So what I want to talk about uh, is a comprehensive approach to skill development that really makes dollars and cents. In other words, it's economically uh, productive. And I want to think about skill development, and I want to think about a whole variety of problems. Not just health, not just crime, not just one thing, but thinking more comprehensively. I want to go beyond the kind of typical fragmented solution, which I think has characterized a lot of economic and social policy. So we know that many people will say, OK, look, if you want to reduce crime, you have more police. If you want to build skills, you want to build, uh, promote skills, have more schools, hire better teachers. For health, have more doctors. I'm not saying any of those are bad solutions. But what we've come to understand is that there are other solutions. And these are solutions about building the capabilities and the skills of individuals. And I think the real strategy, which has turned out to be successful in many areas, not every area, but many areas, 
is basically to invest, whoops, oops, I got ahead of it uh, myself here, okay, to invest in prevention and not remediation. And so I want to try to talk about a unified strategy that, are, that addresses these problems and uses a strategy of human development to promote social mobility, productivity, and reduce inequality. So it's a policy that does prevent problems rather than, and not just prevent problems, but build opportunity so that young children can actually uh, inv take advantage of all the opportunities that might be out there for them only if they had the sufficient skill base, only if they could actually uh, to gain uh, the skills. So for example, one well-documented phenomenon is crime. We know from the work of Terry Moffat, uh, one of my, uh, a person with whom I collaborate, that in studying the onset of criminality for serious offenders, ages three and four turn out to be very important years. It turns out those are the years where we can really start seeing, start targeting where the hardcore offenders will begin. This is not in terms of their cracking safes or driving off with cars, but it's exactly the age at which they show aggressive behavior, what a psychologist would call externalizing behavior. And it just turned out, in a program I'll talk about briefly, the Perry Preschool Program and many early childhood programs have exactly targeted that age three to four. And that's an age of great risk. And when we see and we study the programs that target children in that age group, you see very high success rates. So what do we know? We know from a lot of studies, and this is where the economics comes in, the labor economics, that success, and by success I don't mean a particularly narrow definition, I mean having a healthy life, having essentially the capacity to choose to do what you want to do, what you might want to do. Just the capacities, the capabilities to excel, whatever you want to do, not, not targeting people in one particular area or suggesting they live a particular lifestyle, but we know that the opportunity set of all individuals will be expanded or is expanded when they have the right skills and abilities. So skills are important, we know that. They become even more important in the modern society. And what we've come to understand through a lot of studies is that low levels of these skills cause major social problems. We can see, and I use the word cause uh, deliberately, we can see cases where when we avoid these, uh, uh, when, when we promote these skills, we boost these skills, we can actually, and I'll show you some evidence, we can actually avoid these problems. But these are integrated problems, these are interrelated. And this is where I really want you to think beyond a particularly narrow part of human achievement. So we're gonna think about social problems like dropping out of school, crime, teenage pregnancy, obesity, and poor health. So that's an important thing, is that we really are building capabilities which have multiple manifestations over the lifetime. And these capabilities actually interact with each other. They actually promote each other. There's a synergism that's there. But another important thing that's emerged, another important finding, very important finding, which I think is not sufficiently appreciated, which I think is at a, at a common sense level, is very well appreciated, is that skills are multiple in nature. So much of the public policy discussion about education, and in fact, a lot of the discussion still about early childhood programs, focuses basically on what we call cognitive tests. I mean, think about No Child Left Behind, for example, which has still been the standard program, uh, now under attack. But still, the notion there was we could judge the success or failure of schools, of teachers even, possibly, by looking at test scores. But what we've come to understand, and this is a whole body of research, which Paul Tuff also was working on when he was writing a book, uh, was that multiple skills are necessary. And what's interesting, many of you have heard about the PISA scores by which countries judge their success or failure. Even the OECD, uh, which has promoted the PISA test, these are tests of cognitive skills, recently reissued, or issued, I should say, a report in which they now have a much broader notion about what skills are important for success in life. This is hard, I mean, government agencies, many political figures still do not understand that these multiple skills are, are important and that they can be measured and that we have hard evidence on what are sometimes called soft skills. And so when we understand that these personality skills matter, uh, that these are, are, are extraordinarily uh, important 
for evaluating programs and for even designing programs, thinking of how we get in and actually change the opportunities for children. What we've also come to understand is the gaps in all of these skills, cognitive, uh, social, emotional, or soft skills, if you will, or also health and the health capacities, that the gaps are opening up very early in the lives of children. And schools play a role, there's no question, but it's surprising how much of the gap between the advantage and the disadvantage, however we measure disadvantage or advantage, how much of the gap is showing up before children are entering school? And even how much of the gap is there by age three? And the other part, and this is the controversial part that many people don't like to talk about, although now it's becoming more fashionable as we, as we really understand the data, as we really start understanding the importance, is that the family lives of young children are the major producers of these skills. It's the family. It's the family, it's the family, and it's something that people don't like to talk about, but it's something that we have to address if society is ready to be successful. All of the early childhood programs that have been successful are programs that supplement, work with, and enrich the family. And I think that's a very important dimension. So we used to think at one time, and I think George was talking about this too, I think about 40 or 50 years ago, many people would think, you know, when you talk about skills, that there was a strong notion of heritability, that somehow these things were biologically determined at birth, or maybe even uh, at conception, uh, not be, and not even at birth. But we've come to have a much deeper understanding about how skills are formed for critical and sensitive periods in these skills, and to understand that these very things, like IQ, and cognition uh, and things that have to do with health and things to do with social and emotional skills and personality. These are traits, these are skills that are not fixed at birth, but actually are the targets of policy. But we also have to keep in mind that if we are to have a successful policy, we do have to address the American family's problem. We do have a problem. So we have come to understand the powerful role of the family, We've come to understand that supplementing the family and its resources can be a very successful strategy. But we also have to recognize that the family is ultimately what we're targeting. And the most successful interventions are those that boost families, that strengthen families, and the question then becomes is what are the most productive ways to do so. So let me just summarize some of the evidence. So we know the importance of the early years. What we've come to understand is how skills reinforce each other. So there's a neuroscientific counterpart to this. There's also, I would guess, more of an econometric or psychometric counterpart where we look at the dynamics of skill formation. At some level, this is very intuitive. The greater return arises because of the dynamics of skill formation. We know that life cycle skills are dynamic, formation is dynamic in nature. Skill begets skill, motivation begets motivation. But it's not that just these separate skills have their own lives. They interact with each other. More healthy children are ones who actually will engage in learning. Those people who are more engaged, more open to experience, are also will learn more. Those people who are smarter will have greater levels of self-control, and that will lead down the line towards greater successful, healthy lives. So I think we need to build this into our policy. But we also have to admit, and this is why this, for me, this area is so exciting, that even though the contours are there, there's still a lot to be learned, and we're learning it. We're learning it every day from studies all around uh, uh, the fields, not just in economics, obviously, but in neuroscience and psychology. And it's putting together the notion of exactly where in the skill formation process we can intervene, what roles families play, how we can supplement family life. So I think we need to really rethink public policy to understand this dynamics and to understand the synergisms among these skills. But none of this is particularly new. I mean, 50 years ago, we had published a study by James Coleman, uh, my colleague, former colleague at the University of Chicago. And he showed, when he was looking at the inequality in American schools, that it was inequality in families that played the largest role in the inequality of schooling outcomes, not the resources applied at the school level. And so, we have to understand these points. So let me make a few points which may be obvious to this group, but I think are still important to reiterate. First of all, I think we really do want to emphasize this point of developing cognition and character from conception to birth 
through school, college, and training. So I realize there's a lot of focus on the early childhood years. But I think the most powerful cases for early childhood can be done by saying, well, suppose we don't intervene. Suppose we keep the skill base. We sort of take the skill base at age 14 or 16 and then build public policies around that. And a lot of public policy is still based around that. I'll give you an example. A very important example comes if we were to look at the gap between African Americans and uh, whites and Hispanic Americans and, and whites in terms of who goes to college. And one thing that's emerged from the study is that if you condition and just do a statistical analysis, looking at the level of ability of these children at 14, 15, 16, at the ages in which they're applying to go to college, that ability plays a very important role and explains most of the difference between majority and minority participation in college. Now, if I were to utter that statement 50 years ago, I'd be driven out of the room, uh, tarred and feathered. What's different is that we've come to understand that these skills can be formed that there is malleability. And as we're, we, I'm not saying we can understand it perfectly. We have a lot more to learn. But we've come to understand that these are things that we can develop. Even more recently, we have studies suggesting, you know, comparing some of the early intervention programs, we can boost IQ. Many people say, well, you can't boost IQ. Well, you can. But we also know that the IQ programs, the most successful programs in boosting IQ have been those that have been targeted towards the year zero to three not the later years, not even three to four or four to five. Those are, that, I'm not saying it's too late, but those programs that have been tried have not been that effective. So we really have to understand that these, these are dynamic factors and that we have to think more broadly about skills. So let me uh, give you some, some idea of, uh, of, of, of what I'm saying here. So we've talked a lot, and many people, I think, have talked about this notion of the Gatsby curve. I don't know if Alan Kruger, a few years ago, who was President Obama's head of the Council of Economic Advisors, popularized this. And he pointed out that income inequality at a point in time was closely related to the probability or, or the relationship between a child's income and the parent's income. So that's what's called social mobility. A lot of studies have been reached on that. And now the question is, what do we take out of that? What do we learn from that? What is the link? So it is true as a statistical matter. If you go across societies and go across time periods in societies, the greater the inequality, generally the less the social mobility measured by this ability of the parent and the, the relationship between the parent and the child's outcome. But the question is, what does that mean? And how does you, how does this, what policy does that suggest? Does that suggest a pure policy of income transfers? I mean, for example, the kind of policy that, that the war on poverty started some 50, 51 years ago or so, so 1964. Or does it suggest a more nuanced approach? And I want to argue that, in fact, a more nuanced approach is appropriate, where we really understand some basic facts. The first fact is one you've all seen versions of, that if we look at the gaps between children uh, from advantaged and disadvantaged households, this is using the mother's level of education, that if you look at the gap of, 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 uh, of children, at age 18, the very gap that's very predictive of who goes to college and who doesn't, that that gap is there, uh, really, if you go back on this graph, to about age five, maybe age three. And so what you see is that the early, that these gaps are there, schooling makes some difference, but the gaps start very early. It's really difficult to measure the gaps before age three, but up, up to about age three and later, you can see maybe age two. But the point is, is what you can see, though, is those gaps are there, and they seem to open early on. And that's what led people generations ago to say, OK, this is genetic. It's something that happens at birth. That's one fact. The second fact is the one that I talked about, the family structure. And this is a fact that many people don't like to talk about this, but I think it's important that we address this, because I think this is the core. This is one core aspect of this problem of inequality in American society. And that is, if you look at the children under 18 living in single-parent households, these are American families, generally in the US, the single-parent status is not one where the child has very many good resources. That, in fact, the income levels are generally lower, and the resources available to the mother generally are, 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 are quite. And we can see, and, and this has been documented too, and you've all seen, whoops, oh, I'm jumping around here. Uh, oh. 
I'm jumping more than I thought. <laughs> this is, uh, there we go. Yes, that's what I, I sorry. So we've seen, we've seen this. We know that in these environments of advantage or disadvantage, however we measure that, we see a different kind of environment of children, of child raising, the kind of nature of the interaction, not just in terms of the number of words read to the child, but the quality of the words, the, the nature of the parent-child interaction. And we know that if we just look at this association and look by age three, we see substantial differences in the vocabularies. Now, this doesn't prove anything by itself. But then when we look at, for example, measures of material resources, again, I don't know if you can see the, the graphs, but we look at the highest and the lowest levels, and we can see substantial groups, differences by ethnic group, by income groups, in terms of the material resources and cognitive stimulation given children. And so even though this doesn't prove anything directly, what it does show is that there's a strong association between early family environments and then later child outcomes in terms of these test scores. Now, what can we do about this? So family environments matter, and this is where I've made a case repeatedly that on purely efficient grounds, efficiency grounds, that we know where the, where the highest economic benefits are it comes from those children who are not getting those investments. And we know from a body of studies, which I'll briefly summarize, that early childhood programs can prevent achievement gaps and produce better outcomes. But how do they work? Well, one study that I've gone back to repeatedly is the study of Perry. And this just is a, a graph that I've used repeatedly. You've probably seen it many times. But it, doesn't, uh, it bears retelling each time. Because what happened, and if you looked at all of the early childhood movement in the 1960s, the Perry program, the ABC program, many of the early programs, if you look at that literature in the 1960s, everybody thought that the early childhood programs were there to boost IQ. The whole measure of success or failure of the program was on cognitive skills. And what happened with Perry was initially, when the children were enrolled in the program, they were randomly assigned treatment and control, uh, we followed these children. We actually are collecting data on them right now, of Perry at age 50, so we'll have a, an update on that. What we found is two things. One is the program is very successful. It has a very high economic rate of return. If you calculate the costs and the benefits, higher earnings, less crime, a lot of dimensions of success. But you'll also notice by age 10, the treatment and control group children basically have the same IQ. So it wasn't IQ. What happens in these programs, and what we've come to understand in these programs, and what we've come to understand is that the scaffolding given to the child, the encouragement, the parenting, the surrogate parenting is what's playing a major role in producing the high quality effects of these programs. And what's surprising, and here I've got to show George this. Uh, he set me up for this slide. The Abbasidarian program shows healthy benefits from a comprehensive approach. Let me just show you what they are. So here's a program initially premised on the idea of boosting the cognitive skills. Never mind, social and emotional skills were off the table. Uh, Walter Michel, a famous uh, psychologist, had written in the late 60s that in fact uh, social and emotional skills weren't even that important and they were unstable and weren't meaningful constructs. But what, what happened, of course he, it's ironic if you know who Walter Michel is. Uh, he's the man, uh, the marshmallow man. He wrote a book on it recently. But uh, what, what's interesting is that a program that was originally designed to boost the IQs of children, it did by the way, boost the IQs of children. If you look at this program and say, what were the effects on things that weren't even thought about by the original designers? Then we can see these benefits in terms of health. And so here we actually had surveys done of the ABC treatment and control group at age 35. We have hopes and plans to do this at age 45. If you look at the systolic blood pressure, you'll see that the treatment group, these, these people are all, they're predominantly African Americans, high risk individuals, they all were born into poverty, randomly assigned and followed to age 35, with plans or hopes anyway to follow them into later years. And if you look at these measures of both systolic and diastolic blood pressure, hypertension measures, uh, cholesterol, um, uh, uh, obesity, uh, and pre precursors for uh, diabetes, you see dramatic improvements that came. 
Now, how can this be? People say, well, wait, look, go back to the fragmented solution approach. You should build better hospitals. We should, yes, you should build better hospitals, and you had better health care. And there even was a screening in the ABC program. So the people in the treatment group did have some screening. So there was an aspect of health care. But the real component was also cognitive, social, and emotional skills. These people developed better self-control. These people actually developed ways to actually promote and lead healthier lives and more productive lives. So then we think about this more broadly. We have to think about this diagram where these skills interact, where we think that social and emotional skills promote cognitive skills, cognitive skills promote better health practices, um, social emotional skills are producing a wide variety of, of characteristics, uh, and these things all interact with each other. So when we understand the dynamics of skill formation, we start to understand what wise policies would be. Now what do we know? Again, this is something I worked on a lot, and I still work on it, which is later remediation. We know when I have the policy of saying, well, it's all over at age three, or it's all over at age five. You might believe that, but the fact is a lot of people don't, and you want to show evidence that that may or may not be true, and it's not even true. I and mean, we were talking about Paul Tuff's book, the dean. I mean, there certainly is evidence that later life remediation, especially towards social and emotional skills, non-cognitive skills, can be quite effective, especially if it takes the form of mentoring and guidance. Maybe not as effective as early childhood, but certainly there are ways to essentially promote. So later remediation is generally costly and generally and often ineffective, but there are ways that actually uh, this, they can be used in an effective way. So what do we know in terms of the economic benefits in this case? We know that later remediation is typically not as successful. And, uh, but we also know that later interventions can be successful. Uh, for example, uh, programs, I think Paul Tuff in his book was talking about the One Goal Program, which is a mentoring program in uh, Chicago public schools. I have a graduate student who's just finished an evaluation of that program and showed that you take inner city kids, give them counseling, follow them into college, you can have real effects on their lives even boosting their non-cognitive skills. So what about other policies? And that's always the policy. What else, what else is there? What about promoting education? Well, I want to argue, yes, if we look, for example, at disparities, these are kinds of typical disparities, and this is the kind of thing you'll see in the newspaper. Well, what's the difference, say, in terms of individuals? Just post-compulsory schooling, just going beyond minimum level of schooling. What's the benefit you see in terms of hourly wages, employment, health, obesity, and a number of, of criteria? So what we actually see is substantial effects. But when we break down those effects into components that are actually created by early life factors, and then we look at the total effect, we see that early life factors are playing a substantial component in what the effects of later life education appear to be. So that these effects that I put on here are effects that essentially are looking at disparities. This is what you see in the newspaper. What we can actually see is that, yes, those abilities are created, but the earlier levels of abilities play an important role. So let me, let me conclude by just offering uh, a suggestion. And it's not a suggestion. Uh, it's a suggestion that's partly oriented towards what I think is going to be the debate in 2016. I think a solution of this problem is to think about this discussion about the 99 versus the 1, the problems of income inequality, the problems of the middle class, not to think of this solely in terms of redistribution. Maybe there's a scope for redistribution. I'm not arguing there isn't. But I think there's a very important role for what we call pre-distribution, where what we do is actually build skills of individuals. We create opportunities. And what we've done when we evaluated these successful programs and looked at a number of programs, I should say we evaluated a lot of programs, that we see this graph, which I'm sure many of you have seen before. If we ask, what's the return to a unit dollar invested? What is it? Well, there's very high returns early on. And you ask, why are there high returns early on? Precisely because of the dynamics of skill formation. It's precisely because skill begets skill, that early life skills make a huge difference in terms of creating. So there's a very interesting thought experiment, which I've analyzed, which conducted. I've worked with some graduate students. We're 
we formalize this, it's actually a mathematical theorem, but it's also supported by empirical evidence. And that is, suppose you have a question, you have a certain amount of money, and you want to say, to whom should I invest, in whom should I invest? Should I invest in the really able, smart kid, or should I invest in the most disadvantaged? The old view was one that was suggesting, look, and it's true, by the way, if you were to go to high school or college education, the rate of return to college education of a very smart, highly motivated child is around 20, 25% a year. Huge, huge returns. If you look at a very disadvantaged child at that age, very low returns. Now again, go back to what I was saying. I was conditioning on levels of ability in the college going years. If I go back and say, oh look, I can build the skill base in the early year. What's happening is the phenomenon of what's called, economists call dynamic complementarity. It's, all it's saying is it's harder and harder to remediate at older ages, but it's also saying that there are tremendous opportunities by building the skill base at earlier ages. And under many conditions, it's actually more economically efficient to spend the money in the later years on the more able and motivated children, but to build the skill base on the least able and the least initially motivated children so precisely they can gain the benefits of later life investments. So I think that's the point, is that smart investments and ones that are economically sustainable will start by addressing a major root cause of inequality, which is disadvantaged early childhoods. So I want to come back to the to political discussion. And I, and I really do want to emphasize that this is really an apolitical question. Even though various groups, uh, typically more on one side than the other, have, have supported early childhood in the past, if you look around the country uh, and you look, for example, at the concerns that many people have about uh, the family life, the opportunities offered children, and you think about where dollars are well spent, that this is really apolitical. This is not a Republican issue. It's not a Democratic issue. It's one that really should unite America, and I hope will unite America in the coming years. So thank you very much for your attention. Ah. Can I stay here? We're going to sit down for a couple of questions right over here. I'm going to sit down. Or? Yeah, we'll oh, sit down oh. together. Oh, together. Okay. Just a reminder, if you have questions, if you'll raise them up, we're going to have time for a couple of them this evening, but uh, certainly we're interested. Staff will come collect them, and we've already got some. So first of all, another round of applause. Yay. Thank you so much. So the first question is, thank you, is it's, the, it's all about the family thesis could lead to the conclusion to not focus dollars on childcare and preschool. What are your thoughts on this, and have you seen it? Well, this is something I worked on a lot, and I think it's very important that we understand. Uh, I was talking to Carol earlier at dinner about the Jamaican program, which takes us off to a different part of the world, although it takes us also into rural China. When you're talking about early childhood, you're really talking about creating an environment for the child. The most important and continuing environment for the child is the family. So if you can engage the mother, and you can engage the family, and the neighborhood, and, and the immediate environment, you're going to have a very successful child. So I don't view those as being at odds with each other. I really think it's a, it's a look, there are studies. Annette LaRue, I have a student at uh, Rice University, Flavio Acuna, doing studies asking some very disadvantaged mothers. These are sometimes teenage uh, mothers, mothers mm -hmm. having their first kid, uh, and some as young as 14 or 15. Just basic knowledge about child. Is it good to read to your child? I mean, is it, you know, just basic. And what you find is a lot of ignorance, still, especially among certain groups. And that's why I talk about the divide. People don't like to talk about it, but it's true. There is a divide. And it's not black versus white. This divide is happening all over America, and it's not particularly located uh, in one region or, or one locality, any, any, any of the sort. But for example, in this Jamaican program that I was mentioning, Sally Grantham McGregor, a co-author of mine, a developer of this program, 
went into the slums of Jamaica. She gave an intervention by most standards, certainly not the Educare standard, by, a very, by current standards, pretty low-grade low intervention, but it was teaching the mother to interact with the child, the kind of scaffolding. One hour a week, basically using materials, crude materials that she could fashion from the village. And this version is something we're actually doing now, a version of this program out in rural China for these 60 million left behind rural Chinese children. So it's one hour a week. That's pretty not very intensive program, but it's engaging the mother. And what it did is it changed the lives of the child. And, it, and we, we actually did an evaluation of a published paper in Science Magazine, randomly assigned these kids. 22 years later, you'll see that, the, that those children's wages are 25% higher at age 25, or 20, 20 to 22 percent higher at age 25, those who were in the treatment group versus those in the control. And that was their main intervention. So I think, I th and I'm not saying I have the ideal program. One point I didn't get a chance to make, so I'll make it now. <laughs> you already didn't ask me the question, but I will say it anyway. No, but I, I said it, Perry, I said it ABC. I think the great mistake in the discussion is to say, oh, look, here's Perry. These kids were you know, 50 years ago, the world has changed. The family has not changed. Parenting has not changed. I would bet Lucy was probably a pretty good mother. I'm not sure. But I mean, the basic rules of parenting, I think, are really, are really there. And so when you look at all the studies, and it's not just one study, it's all these studies. Look at uh, the primates that you're going to hear about. I guess you're going to talk something about the primates, right, tomorrow? No? Maybe. I hope you talk about primates. <laughs> anyway, you hear some. But if you look at almost all the studies, the primate studies and all the, the experimental and the non-experimental studies all point in the same direction. So it's the question of the family, the parenting, that, that interaction. And I think, uh, I think that's, the, that's the point that's out there. So it's not a single program. And I think I'd be really dishonest to say I have the ideal program. We know we're experimenting. We're learning about all the. But I think the ingredients are the family. But to me, it's, it's amazing that an hour a week for just a short period of time, 18 months really, was successful enough in promoting the well-being of these kids when they're in their mid-20s. That's pretty amazing. That is. You're absolutely right. Talk, read, sing. OK. I had to say it. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. So. <laughs> Next question. As a family child care provider, I have the advantage to see the effects of family struggles firsthand. With a large population of African-American males incarcerated, how do we, I, implement practices to build skills within a family structure such as these? And shouldn't these practices be included, inclusive in standards which qualify a child care program as quality? Well, there are a lot of aspects of that question. Right. And, uh, and some of this gets into some hot button issues where people are saying, you know, uh, well, we want to change the family. And other people, not me, say somebody sitting here, um, if they wanted to, uh, could talk about, you know, shotgun weddings and, you know, all kinds of things. I think what we, again, I would say supplement the family. I certainly agree that in certain African American neighborhoods, certainly not all by any means, but some in certain other neighborhoods, Hispanic neighborhoods, Appalachian whites, American Indians, mm -hmm. and so forth, what you find is that there are serious challenges in terms of the resources available to the parents. And when I mean resources, I don't mean just money. I mean the knowledge about what's good for the child, how you could interact, and so forth. To me, that is uh, how you might address this question. So it's not telling the parents to do anything. It's not telling anybody to do anything. A coercive solution is not going to work. I think you're going to offer the skills. Now, there's going to be an image. Small, I would say it's small, but I honestly don't know the, the magnitude of this. I would say there aren't very many parents who don't mean well for their children if they're given the information. And you can tap that knowledge. Now, you see that in every program I've ever seen where parents are offered the opportunity to have a better life for their children, they will try to take advantage of it. And I think if we enrich the, the resources, and, I, and again, I emphasize it's not just money. In fact, I'm not even sure that money is the key. Look, we see successful immigrant groups. Successful groups, even among the most disadvantaged financial groups, where the parenting structure is very stable. I mean, in Chicago, we had studies of the so-called Robert Taylor homes, which were now torn down, but they were really kind of a breeding ground for crime and gangs and so forth. 
But a lot of the children that came out of those families were really successful children. And you looked at what were the ingredients? It was, you know, if the psychologist would say, well, measures of conscien how conscientious the parent was. But there really was this, I would say, scaffolding. There was a sense of the mother staying with the child. It was typically the mother mm -hmm. staying with the child and reinforcing. I think giving the child's mother those kinds of resources, maybe providing the resources in a child care center to supplement it. But it's got to be working with the family. Yeah. And I think I realize that that's become politically, although it has, it's now becoming more openly discussed, right? Yes. I yes, mean, look, definitely. I mean, people talked about the Moynihan report, right? That was 50 years ago. Uh, and, you know, Mohena, Moynihan was pointing out, if you remember the graph I put up showing the number of kids being uh, in single parent families, Mo Moynihan was pointing out that in African American families at that time, 28% of all children were in that status. That's become a much higher percentage. 28% is actually about the percentage for the whole country as a whole now. And what we have then is a changed family environment for whatever reason. But I think we can supplement that environment. I don't think we can start you know, putting blue laws. And Some people are talking about a return you know, to Victorian morality. Uh, David Brooks in his dreamier columns is, uh, <laughs> uh, is going off in that direction. And yeah, it's, a, it's a possible speculation. Uh, but I don't think, I mean, that's fine. I don't mind. Maybe we do want a Victorian uh, society again. <laughs> Uh, Sigmund Freud wouldn't have agreed, but that's another thing. <laughs> but, but, but quite seriously, I, I do think that we have practical tools without being invasive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we want to do. And I think when those tools are provided, people take advantage of them. I'd say the rest will, will, take its, will, take its, will fall into place. So. Thank you. So last question is, why are non-cognitive soft skills so difficult for so many politicians and others to understand? <laughs> Well, for politicians, it may be that they lack them. So. <laughs> no, actually, I would say, actually, most politicians would have a great level of non-cognitive skills. They would work the crowd. We saw already today, right, yes. uh, your governor and so forth. So, 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 and that's one of the non-cognitive skills, you know, openness to experience and engaging people. See, this is the kind of, I'll tell you, I, I'll give you my personal theory. I think this is where we've educated ourselves to be ignorant. See, I think 50 years ago, cognitive psychology was the be-all and end-all of psychology. I don't know if Judy would agree, but that was part of it. The idea that cognition was really important. As I was saying, Walter Mischel, a very distinguished psychologist, basically said there was no such thing as stable personality traits. And that the image was we were like this old Woody Allen movie, Zelig, you know, we are what we need to be. But this, there's been a resurgence in personality psychology. We've come to understand that we can measure these traits, they, they do vary in a situation. I mean, I we could go on a whole lecture on this question because it's a very important question. But I think what we do know is there is stability in these characteristics. And at an intuitive level, we know they're important. The conscientious kid. I mean, the tortoise and the hare wasn't invented uh, in uh, uh, 2000. Uh, that's, that goes back uh, at least to several thousand years, I think. And, and the story of saying, staying with it, stick to itiveness, you know. Teddy Roosevelt, you know, talked a lot about uh, grit, actually. That was his term. And it's been very popularized now. I think these, at a very intuitive level, it's just that we got ourselves educated to think cognition was the be-all and end-all. So our public teaching, our, our public assessment of schools is in a measure of cognition. Not IQ, but an achievement test, which is pretty closely related to IQ, but still matters somewhat in terms of non-cognitive skills. We've now got a much richer understanding of what, how to measure people. I mean, with good measurement systems. This report that I put up from PISA is actually a long discussion of successful measurement systems that have been tried around the world that are predictive, that can be used in schools. There are a lot of studies underway. So I think it's just a question that, you know, we, we, so we get to be kind of learned ignoramuses in some sense, right? We, we, we say, oh, cognition, we all learned that IQ is really important. And then we also learned at some time, a lot of us learned, well, it was all genetically determined. And these are all things that we know. Cognition is important. It's important to be smart. But it's also important to be persistent. You know, I think the old saying, you know, 99% uh, what genius is 1% inspiration or 99% perspiration. I mean, this is a very common, and this, so at, the, at a deep level, when we get past the kind of formal teaching, the, the kind of what, what you learned in college, and you go back to your intuition, 
then you're in good company. I mean, you're, you're on solid ground again. So I, I just kind of maybe de-educate yourself a little bit, <laughs> which could be putting myself out of a job. I mean, I, <laughs> but, but no, but I think it's just a question of using common sense in this case. And I, and I agree with you that many politicians don't uh, understand it. I'll give you a, a, case, a case in point, uh, which is, I think, uh, not relevant quite to uh, California, but it is to Illinois. About eight years ago, I had a meeting with a former governor of Illinois who's currently serving a 14-year <laughs> prison sentence. <laughs> but he came down to the University of Chicago, and we, he was supposed to meet with us for an hour, and he met with us the whole day. But the one thing that fascinated him was, yes, he, he understood that non-cognitive skills were important. So if you remember, just before he went into prison, he went into Wendy's, I think, was shaking everybody's hands and so on. <laughs> non so he knew that at an intuitive level. But, but the point is, is that it just didn't get its way into public policy. And No Child Left Behind is probably the supreme example where a test score at the fourth grade, which does have predictive power, was then the way to measure all schools and successive, and that was demented, and it, it, it shouldn't be. No, it was demented, it shouldn't be. But we knew that. And, and no, many, many, no, many teachers, everybody who was there working with students knew that was bad. And every piece of evidence been collected. So, but see, that's where kind of, that's where I think that uh, educators can be sometimes unproductive. <laughs> they, they think they know the answers. I didn't say I knew anything other than I think mothers matter, these skills matter, and I think we have a lot to learn. Well, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> so, what an incredible evening we have had. And so, on behalf of all of us here in California, I want to thank you not only for your words, this evening, but for the work you have done. It has really moved the needle forward, as they say. Thank you, Dr. Heckman, so much. Thanks Thank so you. much. All right. <laughs> there you go.